And I remember him ashing the cigarette out on the credit memo. And I'm looking at the three million dollar <laughs> deal. And I it's like he's lighting your money on fire, basically. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think my tear ducts are dry, so I couldn't cry. So Alan's not here, but the show must go on. Uh, the show must go on. We've got an exciting episode, and I, I really wish he was here for this one because he could tell part of this story uh, from another viewpoint. But this is 95% of the reason I did this show, because I wanted to be able to tell the safari deal story to the world. <laughs> uh, now we finally get to do it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the BDO Show. This is a podcast for passionate BDOs wanting to level up their game with advice and stories from battle-tested BDOs. I'm your co-host, Emily Detour, and I'm here with my fellow co-hosts today, Chris Hackney, Sterling Birdsong. Alan Peterson is here in spirit. Um, he is not feeling well, but the show must go on. Uh, before we get started, I want to uh, just give a quick reminder to go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button. And if you have any questions or have anything you want to submit to us as topics you'd like to see discussed on the show, shoot us a quick email at thebdoshow at gmail.com. BDOs. Have you ever had a borrower bring in like a brother-in-law to do their life insurance? Doesn't end well, does it? We've all been there. When you require life insurance on your SBA loan, it's critical that you bring in a company that specializes in getting these policies in place for the SBA loans. The last thing you want is for life insurance to be the holdup. We all know that's a rookie mistake. SBA protection quick close life insurance is the fastest, easiest way to secure the insurance protection that your borrower needs for their SBA loan. Their process is simple, hassle-free, and only takes a few minutes of your borrower's time. No lengthy paperwork, no complicated forms. They even have programs that don't require labs or doctor records for approval. And best of all, you will have the collateral assignment back in less than 24 hours. It's a no-brainer. Go to sbaprotection.com for more information or email Adam Bergen at adam at sbaprotection.com. Again, thank you for being with us. So today we'll be exploring the incredibly important topic of declines, and I'm immediately going to hand this over to Chris Hackney so he can lead the way on the discussion. All right, decline. So there's an infamous decline or declination uh, that, that Sterling encountered, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago at this point. About two yeah, years. it was uh, middle of, of uh, 2022. So Sterling calls me one day, and at the time I was uh, in a management role, um, and he walks me through this deal, and it, it seems like a reasonable deal, but there was a little bit of a a Tiger King element to it towards the tail end uh, when he started to continue Boo. to talk about the deal. <laughs> and I said, something just doesn't sit quite right with me on this one, Sterling. I'll support you as the lender that you are and your integrity, but this feels a little Carol baskin -y. No disrespect to Carol Baskins. I think she's a wonderful person. Um, <laughs> hope to meet her one day. But uh, that deal went into committee. Um, it got restructured a number of times, and we weren't able to get it done. Uh, Sterling, from your viewpoint, should we have done that deal and why? Absolutely. Absolutely. So let me let me go ahead and just run through this deal right really quickly here. So and let me preface this by saying if there's one thing that you should take away from today's episode as a BDO that's watching this, I always say this to people, especially when they're new, just because you need a deal doesn't make it a deal. OK, um, your pipeline does not determine your bank's risk appetite. All right. Just let's be clear on that. However, with that being said, this was a deal, okay? This was a deal that should have gotten done. Let me just run through this high level. All right, so these guys were buying a safari in Texas. 400 animals, 200 acres, uh, 1.5 times debt service coverage, 60% loan to value, okay? They're putting 15% down. We had four guarantors, uh, combined liquidity of $3 million. Um, Two of the buyers live next door, OK, they lived next door to the property. They ran a ranch next door, so they were already used to dealing with hooved animals. Uh, they had strong outside income uh, from real estate development, property managing, and they had a portfolio of 36 rental properties. OK, I mean, worst case scenario, they could have taken this property, sold all the animals off, parceled it out and probably made more money than operating a safari on this piece of real estate. OK, this deal was a slam dunk. All right. I got slaughtered in committee. 
slaughtered in committee. I, I, to this day, I don't, I don't really know what happened. I mean, they sent me back with so much homework. They had me looking up how many baby zebras had every year, how many, uh, antelopes, uh, they, they were going to produce on an annual basis. I mean, I brought it back the following week. I had more information about these animals than Jack Hanna. I mean, I, I was <laughs> so deep in the weeds at this point. I believe so much in this deal and we still declined it. Uh, you know, the, the bottom line was, is that we just didn't want to do a zoo. I, I don't think anybody wants to say, hey, remember that zoo loan we did? Uh, well, they just missed a payment. Or, hey, you know, we're going to have to foreclose on that zoo. I, I just don't think anybody wanted to have those types of conversations. Not that it ever would have happened, but um, bottom line is, you know, uh, you, you can't win them all. And, and unfortunately, I lost that one. Well, that, that debt service coverage is uh, continuing to improve improve every time you tell that story. I didn't remember one five, but we'll take it. Um, oh, no. I, I, I did the homework because <laughs> I knew we were going to talk about this one today. I went back and saw the credit package. There you go. And I think the challenge was uh, the industry experience, too. And I just remember looking at the collateral chart and having like the cost of a zebra in the collateral chart just seemed a bit <laughs> odd to me. But you know, it was a first for everything in SBA lending. So from that deal, Sterling, obviously it didn't work out here at your shop. Uh, you know, walk us through, did you hand that off to another lender? Do you, how was the conversation with the borrower? Because obviously you had to restructure it. Walk us through what happens when a loan is declined. Yeah. So in that situation, so technically we, we actually didn't decline that loan, but we, we asked for so much from the guarantor that essentially it was it was similar to a decline. And, you know, when I had the conversation with the with the customer, you know, they wanted essentially a, another million dollars in equity, either from from his pocket or uh, from the seller holding some type of a note. You know, I went back. I, I certainly you know gave it the old college try trying to speak to talk him into uh, getting that. Um, however, at that point, he was no longer interested in moving forward with the financing. Um, so, it, you know, I said, Hey, you know, I, I want to see you su be successful. I want to see you succeed. Um, I'm happy to make some introductions to other banks. And so that's what I did. You know, I, I don't just leave people, uh, to fend for themselves. If I'm not going to be able to get a deal done for them, I do always try and at least make a warm introduction. And that's just another way that I'm also able to kind of feed the lenders that are in my circle because there's reciprocity there, right? You know, um, there's deals that aren't going to fit my shop and I'll be able to, you know, help them uh, with their production. And then there's going to be deals that don't fit their shop. And then they could potentially help me with my production sometime later on down the road. So that's what I typically do. So did you, did you send this one out to another lender or what happened? Yeah, with it? Was it funded by someone else? So, um, you know, I, I'm not sure if this guy ever got funded actually. So I did introduce him to a couple of different banks. Uh, one of them was looking at doing it as a USDA loan. I know that they did not end up moving forward with it. Um, however, I'm not sure what happened with the with the other lender. But um, to this day, yeah, I don't know if if my my guy ever ended up getting his safari. I kind of want to look it up <laughs> and Google it and see if I see his face smiling on the website. But uh, yeah, I, I don't. I can't say for sure if that one got funded or not. Out of curiosity, what year was this? 2022. Okay, so, so this wasn't that long ago. Okay. So it was post COVID. Yeah, it was post COVID. And I mean, it's one at of those. At the height of Tiger King, though. Kind of. At the height of, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 2020 so that, that was fresh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. yeah. He was, he was two years behind on getting that deal done. That was a problem. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes timing does matter. But, uh, but how about you, Chris? I mean, do you have any memorable declines? Oh, absolutely. And I was just bringing it up in our uh, executive uh, session we had like last week because we were pursuing an insurance vertical. And I went back. This has got to be five years at this point. Uh, oh, no, we're in 2024. Yeah, five or six years. I had a $3 million insurance agency acquisition because we wanted to do insurance acquisitions at the time. Did my homework, found some brokers and network. I got a $3 million deal. This lady already owned an agency, uh, an insurance agency in Atlanta, was buying another book of business. Good cash flow, solid deal. It was just largely unsecured mostly everyone in committee liked the deal. And the way it works in our shop, there's a two loan committees. So you have a loan committee on Tuesday, which is a, what we call officer's loan committee. Uh, then if it's approved at that stage and it's greater than $2 million, it goes to a second loan committee, which comprise, is comprised of our board members. 
uh, for this particular loan, because it was an insurance vertical, we have a board member who owns uh, an insurance agency and is very affluent individual and well-known in the community. So we had to meet with him in sort of a backdoor meeting for breakfast, I remember, and he takes the credit package. He's, uh, you know, he smokes a cigarette for, for breakfast and a little, a little bit of coffee. Um, looks at it, he said, we shouldn't do this deal. Doesn't give the reasons why. And then I remember him ashing the cigarette out on the credit memo. And I'm looking at the three million dollar <laughs> deal. And I it's like he's lighting think, their money on fire, basically. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think my tear ducts are dry, so I couldn't cry. And I remember uh, Tom, who was the president of our SBA division. Uh, we just walked back to the bank across the street uh, from where we were, and he just gives me a pat on the back as if I was a son that just you know had his heart broken. And then I just thought, like, wow, to have uh, the career we have where you have either one person or a committee that is in control of your fate and your income. I was considering a career switch altogether, to be honest. That one, I said, that it's a $3 million deal. What if he continues to do that? You know, was it me? Was it the industry? Was it actually the loan? Was he in a bad mood and just didn't want to approve that loan? To have, it really shook me up for a bit. I got over it eventually uh, somewhat, but that's my most memorable decline. And I actually still bring it up at least once a year to Tom, that she actually was successful and acquired that agency with another bank and has bought more books of business since then. So I guess that brings me to a good question. Um, loan committee or single signer preferred? What have you guys experienced more of? What's your preference? Yeah, I actually, you know, I think loan committees are antiquated, but I actually prefer them. I wouldn't want to be in a place where there's a dictator and a single signer. Uh, you know, if that person's in a bad mood, that person has had a bad experience with a certain industry and the deals that you bring in, and they think that all gym and fitness centers are bad loans, you're not going to get your deals done. But if you have a loan committee, a committee of five or seven, or whatever the number is, uh, you have independent thought. Um, then you also have groupthink, which happens a lot as well. You usually have, there's one or two leaders in committee. And if you can get them on board for a deal, the rest of the group is going to kind of think that way. So I think your odds are better when you have loan committee, because you can kind of, these are the two or three people I need to go to, to kind of, you know, make sure they understand this deal. And then that will permeate through the rest of the group where that, that single signer, they could just not like you as a lender not like your your deals that you bring in and it's hard to recover from that. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. Um, you know, I, I've never been in a single signer shop. Um, I do think that ideally um, I, I probably would prefer it to uh, going through a, a loan committee. Um, however, like you said, a lot of it comes down to who that particular person is. Um, if it's somebody who's pretty stable and you can, and they're predictable, um, and you know that, you know, it's never going to be personal. It's always going to be about the credit that's being presented. Then I, I do think that that is, that is the ideal way to get production done, um, because what ends up happening with committees is that you have to wait for them. They have to convene. Uh, so, you know, you probably like us, you know, we have two committees a week, uh, one on Tuesday and one on Thursday morning. However, you know, in a situation where you would have just one signer, um, potentially you could send out a credit on a Monday or on a Friday or on a Wednesday, and you could very quickly get some feedback on it. And then it's only one person that you quote unquote have to impress, right? Um, versus, you know, sometimes when you get inside of committee and you start doing the dog and pony, like you say, sometimes you do get a little bit of the group think. Um, and sometimes, you know, if, if one person can kind of, uh, pierce your shield, all of a sudden it seems like you're getting beat up by five different people at the same time, uh, which can be a very uncomfortable experience, especially if you're a new BDO, you know, I'm at the point now in my career where I have a little bit more credibility in the shop. You know, the guys know me, I know them, I know what most of their pain points are. And I'm not going to take it very personally because I did $50 million in production last year. So I know that they're going to do some of my deals. They're going to do most of my deals. So if I get a decline now, it still hurts. Don't get me wrong, but it doesn't hurt as much as when I had, you know, $5 million in production. Right. And uh, when you're losing that $3 million deal and you don't know if you're going to be able to hit 10 in an entire year. Yeah, it, it really it really does hurt, especially when you feel like maybe the committee didn't give you a fair shake and maybe you feel like you're getting ganged up on a little bit, but 
you know, what I would say is that in this business, very rarely is it actually personal. Um, a lot of it comes down to the deal and the way that it's been presented. Yeah. And, and you brought up a good point, Emily, uh, just real quick. The single signer is definitely more fluid and you're going to get your answers faster. I feel if you're just having to go to one person to have them get the deal signed off on versus a loan committee, you know, and the frequency that they meet. So I uh, definitely agree with you there. I just fear, you know, having a single signer, think of the most conservative chief credit officer out there. And I, I've, I've dealt with a few of them being the only person that could sign off on your deals that would make for, uh, you know, a long life in SBA lending. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that is a fair point as well. So again, you know, it really does come down to the person, right? Because if you have a person who, you know, you can work with, who's like, again, fairly predictable, then I think that it's, it can be a fantastic thing. If you know that your guy is extremely conservative, well, then, you know, uh, most likely you, you might not be at that shop very long because <laughs> you're not going to get a lot of production done. And if you're not producing, then that means you're not eating and you're not going to be happy and you're probably just going to eventually move on. But, you know, it, it's going to be to the detriment of that shop long term as well, because if they keep on losing talent over time and they're not able to hit their number, well, you know, uh, th they're not going to hit the, the number they need to be able to survive for very long. Right. So. Um, you know, it can kind of cause different issues, but no, you're right. It, it does hundred percent come down to the individual. When is it a good time to leave a shop due to declines? Is it, you know, you say you get a bunch of, a bunch of bad deals all in a row and you're feeling beat up or is it the shop you're at and it's time to part ways based on personality, maybe clashes or, small thinking. What do you guys think about when it's time to leave and or your thoughts just for the new BDOs out there who might be feeling beat up currently right now in the infancy of their career? So I would say if you know that you're bringing in good credits and your deals are not getting done and then you're passing those deals on to BDOs who are quite frequently able to get them done, then that should be a sign to you. Um, you know, the I'm a, I'm a big, the grass is not always greener guy, by the way. I don't necessarily think that as soon as you have some issues, you should immediately think about jumping ship and going elsewhere. I think that most issues can be sorted out. However, um, certain banks have certain risk appetites. And if you know that your bank doesn't have the same risk appetite as some of your competitors and you're regularly, regularly losing out on deals because of that, then yeah, maybe it is something that you should consider, you know, uh, talk to the people at that other bank and ask them about some of the declines that you had recently, ask them if they feel like they'd be able to get that done, you know, talk to maybe their, their manager or maybe their credit person and ask them, Hey, are these the type of deals that you're able to, to get home on? If the answer to that is consistently, yes, then, you know, um, if you're not happy with your production and where you are right now at your bank, if you feel like you're not doing enough, then then, yeah, maybe it is time to consider a change. You know, it's funny. You uh, brought that question up, Emily. Today, Sherlin and I, we, we looked at a deal with our chief credit officer and uh, some other members, and I thought it was a deal that should get done. Um, solid deal and go into the, the, the merits of it. But after I went to our SBA credit office, I said, I said he's going to leave. I said, I said, if I was him, I'd be out of here. <laughs> and not then the Sterling didn't tell me anything. It didn't didn't say that. And I wouldn't say that to any like executives. But the SBA credit officer, we're all we have a good rapport where I could say that. Um, because to me, if you get to a point where you're passing on a lot of of, of opportunities elsewhere, as Sterling said, you got to look at you have a limited run rate and window in your SBA career. I don't think it's wise to stay at a shop where you're not able to get your deals approved. Um, you need to find a shop where you can actually get your deals approved and you can make income for yourself and help borrowers um, borrow money. Uh, it's just that simple. Um, you should not have, uh, to me, you really shouldn't have any declines. Ideally, you should know your credit box after being there for six to eight months. Um, but if you're running more than a 20% decline, 10 to 20% in that front, it's, it's time to Time to pack it up and look for some somewhere else, unless there are you know efficiencies in your closing process and you have a BDA and there are things that mitigate your declines. Uh, there might be a reason to stay put. So you got to look at the entire picture. But just from looking at a declination standpoint, you really have to pay attention to what your percentages are. And if you start to be north of twenty percent of deals that actually go into underwriting, 
and do not get approved. So that's the threshold. They go into underwriting and that decision, more than 20% are getting declined. You might want to start looking at your credit box and seeing if it's a fit for the type of deals you bring in to that bank. Yeah. And, and I would say that, you know, if it ever does get to a situation where you feel like things maybe are getting a little bit personal, I mean, you know, I, I sit here and tell you that, you know, uh, nine times out of 10, it's probably not personal. It probably just has to do with the deal. But, you know, there is that one time out of 10 where, you know, uh, I always sit here and preach and say that it's really human beings that make these, these decisions, right? It's not necessarily always about the, the numbers, right? It's, it's humans lending to humans is really what banking is at its core. So, um, if I'm going to say that on one hand, I also have to say that, yeah, on the other hand, if you feel like you're not getting a fair shake and you see that other BDOs who have similar types of deals are getting deals done, um, if you if you sense anything like that, then I would say it's probably time to start looking for other options as well. That was a good callback to the uh, AI episode. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So good. So there could be some personality clashes, you're saying, in this world. And I guess my... The, the the next thing I was thinking about when you guys were talking about, you know, it's about the borrower. How do you deliver news to your referral source, to your borrower, when there is a decline and then you're delivering it, what seems like over and over? How does that, like, can you guys remember the first time you had to tell a borrower or a broker or any referral source, you're like, hey, so... <laughs> This stinks, but here comes some bad news. Like, how do you, as a new BDO, how would you um, recommend they approach this particular part of it? Since it's a big part, it, you send them a text message and <laughs> turn your phone off. <laughs> just about an hour. throw it off a bridge and just keep you, going. You just ghost them. You just block them you and just, just run away. You just go to another <laughs> bank and change your email address. And let them figure it out. So that's when you know to uh, leave. You just. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, if you don't want to call them, just find a new job. But no, seriously, the, the decline or declination calls, those are some of the, the toughest calls, of course, to tell someone, hey, your dream can't be fulfilled with us. It can be fulfilled elsewhere. Uh, that's tough. What my advice would be to make the call as quickly as possible. I do find that a lot of lenders, especially newer, you, you, you're apprehensive to, to deliver that news and, you know, you find other things to do in your day. And, the loan was declined at nine in the morning and you don't get around to calling them until five or maybe nine the next day. Right. And it's like, uh, you know, a quick no or a quick update on the news, whether good or bad, um, definitely helps soften the blow some and say, hey, I tried everything I could. Here's what I try to do to restructure it and, and just be as transparent as possible to you're not perfect as a loan officer. You don't control the decisions to is some thing that I often tell them. Uh, but just delivering the news as quickly as possible is the most important rather than exactly what you say, what you say to the customer. Yeah. Good news can wait. Bad news can't. That's what I always say. All right. So, you know, if you want to wait a, a couple hours to call your customer and tell them that they're approved, that's fine. But as soon as you know that you have to decline somebody, you should probably rip that bandaid off and and do it quickly. You know, um, I've gotten better at it over time. It's not easy the first time that you're going to have to tell somebody no. I mean, no, none of us get in this business to tell people no. We get in this business because we want to help people. We want to fund their dreams and their goals, and we want to see people be successful. But, you know, the other side of that is if you get to play kingmaker, you know, sometimes you also have to decline people, right? So, you know, the one thing that I say that I do that would probably be helpful is that I'm very transparent with people from the beginning. So as soon as we have our first call, I'll already start telling people what's wrong with their deal. You know, if there's weaknesses in their credit, I'm going to tell you, hey, here's the strengths of this credit. Here are the weaknesses of this credit. Just so they're not blindsided when I come back in, you know, a couple of weeks and tell them, hey, we weren't able to get this done because of the weaknesses. You know, I'll, I'll even tell people like, hey, you know, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure about this one. You know, I, I think it's worth us having a conversation. It's worth us digging a little bit deeper. But, you know, I'm not 100 percent sure that I'm going to be able to get this across the finish line for you. And I think most people really appreciate that honesty. And then what it also does for you is that when you are able to get it done, then, hey, you're the hero. Right. You've already kind of set it up in a, in a situation like, hey, uh, I don't know if it's going to happen or, or if it's not going to happen. And then if you can deliver that good news and it's everybody's happy, it's it's really a celebration. But, you know, I try and, and emphasis on the word try. I mean, none of us are perfect. You know, I'm still getting better all the time, but I, I try to never let it be a surprise if somebody is getting declined. 
Okay, so now here's another scenario. Surprise, you were declined, and you as a BDO were also thrown off because you're like, I, I peeled that open. I know everything about it. I brought it to my credit committee like full, like I knew, I thought this thing was going to get approved, and it doesn't. And then you go back to your borrower and you say, hey, these are the things, A, B, and C. Work on them. Work on them six months to a year. Come back, possibly. Um, have you ever, uh, that's going to be my next question is, have you ever had a decline? Maybe gave that borrower some advice, maybe even the broker to look out for the next time they bring a type of deal in. Has it ever been revived, brought back from the dead? Have you guys ever had that happen with any of your deals before where you brought them back and everyone's like, you know, it works now. Things look stronger to us. So Sterling, why don't you kick that off? Sure. You know, that that stuff does happen from time to time uh, where you say, hey, you know, and, and here's the thing. Again, I'm very honest with customers. So if I'm surprised, I'm going to tell you I was surprised. Yep. I'm going to say, hey, you know what? Uh, I didn't see this one coming. You know, they, they surprised me. I thought this was a pretty strong deal, but here's what they don't like about it. And so if you can work on those things, maybe come back in six months or a year, we'll take a different look at it. And, you know, maybe you'll get an approval, you know, um, nine times out of 10 in that situation, they just go to another bank. OK, they'll, they'll go find a bank that wants to do their deal right now uh, so they can get funding and they can move on. However, every once in a while, you do have somebody who will stick around, do what's necessary and and come back to you. And then you have the other issue, which is internally in your shop. You also have to then get the stink off the deal, right? Because realistically, once a deal has already been presented and it's already been declined, even if it's a little bit nicer and you've shined it up a little bit, there's still that preconceived notion about the deal from the last time that you previously presented it. So it's going to take a little bit of, uh, you know, talking and, and, and really kind of getting everybody on board and kind of prefacing it with, hey, they did what we told them to do. Here's let's take a look at this again. Now that we've met the requirements that we were looking for in the first place, you know, um, that that can be more of a difficult part as opposed to actually getting them to come back sometimes. But, yes, I have had success with that in the past. It does happen. And uh, it is something that I will tell borrowers as well. Yeah, I have a, a wonderful story uh, that just shows the power of SBA. There were, uh, when I was pursuing the veterinary vertical, met this couple at a veterinary conference, um, nice couple. They were looking to, uh, they had acquired a practice via seller financing, right? Terms were not favorable, very high interest rate. We uh, were able to uh, look at a debt refinance package to pay off the seller note. But the the veterinarian uh, had very poor credit. He had tax lien, just not the best on paper. And I told them transparently, I said, hey, this is going to be tough. And they said, well, no other banks are willing to give us a shot. We just want at least a shot, Chris. Can you just can you get us into committee and maybe something will work out for us? Uh, they were African-American, too. And so I just, hey, we're going to do our best. And we got beat up in committee. It did not go well. Um, just from the personal derogatory items on his credit, didn't have a lot of liquidity. And after that, I really counseled them long and hard, not just like, here's what's wrong with the deal, but here's what you need to do personally to get your finances in order. You know, you're a great veterinarian, good practice, but you're not doing yourself a service the way you manage your personal finances. They took a Dave Ramsey class, which I didn't advise that. They did it on their own. Uh, within a, less than a year, they'd improved their credit, um, had some money in the bank, paid off a lot of credit cards, paid off a car. Went to that same conference, actually it was a full year, went to that same conference, found me at the booth, and they said, hey, Chris, look at this. And they pull up their FICO scores on there. They're mm -hmm. like mid-sevens, and they're just so happy. And they said, you took a shot on us, so we're going to give you a shot. Because at that time, now they were a highly coveted borrower by the practice solutions groups of the world, the Bank of America, the people that finance a lot of veterinarians. Um, so we got the shot this time. Now we had to drop the spread and offer them a very attractive rate because now they had options, right? So I was very happy to bring that loan back into committee. And I say, well, you guys should have taken a shot on these borrowers a year ago. One, we could have got a much better rate. And two, they've improved themselves tremendously from where they were. So we did that loan. They paid off the seller note. Fast forward three years later, they have since sold that practice and now they are millionaires uh, <laughs> five or six times over. That's amazing. They live in Belize. They have a home here in Florida. We went out to dinner when they sold their practice uh, as well. They treated me to dinner. And they, I mean, that's one of the most memorable stories I have. They went from decline and they didn't just say, oh, no one's going to help me. They did the work. 
They revived their, their credit scores, improved their credit scores. We brought it back in. We got it approved. They paid off their loan. They became wealthy or rich uh, in the span of three or four years via SBA. So very cool story there. So you can revive some some dead deals with the right counseling. And now if you ever get a dog, you'll have free medical services for the rest Absolutely. of your life. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and P.S., Chris and I met at a veterinary trade show in Orlando in, what was it, 2021? I think That's the right. first time we met That's was at memory. a veterinary trade show, which was awesome. And then we've been friends ever since. So um, yep. now the second part of that would be your brokers. Now say you're, issue, you're getting decline after decline and you really are kind of shocked. And I guess there, this could be a two-part question. Broker brings you a deal and you're like, sorry, that's probably not going to get through committee. Or they bring you a deal and you're like, yeah, that'll that'll go over well. And it doesn't. So number one, how do you turn down a broker on the front end? Like that's not a good deal. And how do you deliver a bad, you know, how do you deliver a decline to a deal you thought would have funded? And how do you keep their business as well if you're delivering decline after decline and you like, don't, don't leave. I swear this will, this will work eventually, but you know, they also have a business to run as well. So what's your advice there? Yeah, you're, you're probably not going to retain their business if you're declining a lot of their deals. It's just human nature, right? If I'm sending all my well, deals to... you built to, a relationship. I mean, does that... Where does? I mean, you can be friends and get pizza yeah. and you know, a couple of drinks on the weekend. <laughs> but if I'm sending you a deal and you're, you're declining 10 out of 10 of my deals, I'm probably not going to send you deal number 11, right? Now, if there's a chance that you're doing some of them and I can start to have conversations on, okay, let's figure out what works, what deals are working. That's what I typically do with brokers that um, maybe the deals aren't a perfect fit. I'll pull them to the side or we'll have a call like, hey, here's our box. Here's the window we need to be in. Anything outside of that is just not working. Um, And I always say, too, a quick no is a good no. I think everyone knows that phrase by now. If you see a deal from a broker... Don't think, oh, I can probably stretch to make this work, especially a newer relationship, right? You don't want to start off on the wrong foot. Maybe if something uh, with someone that you're more established with, you can start to take some mm-hmm. risk and stretch your credit box. But with newer relationships, you definitely have to be, hey, this fits our box, this doesn't, and give them a quick and uh, transparent note to build that relationship. Yeah, as Chris said, I think that um, it is very tough to maintain a broker relationship when you are declining most of their deals. But I would say that the way that you can do it is just by being very transparent on what it is that you can do. If you know your credit box and you can at least tell the broker like, hey, you know, this isn't really what I do. Startups we're not really good at or we don't really do restaurant deals, but we will do these larger scale biz acts or whatever it is that your shop does really well. Um, If you can just train them and say, hey, you know, wait until you have a deal like this, then bring it to me. And I, you know, I feel a lot more confident that I can get it funded. Um, That's how you keep a broker around that maybe, you know, you're not getting a lot of deals done for. Now, with that being said, once they do send that one to you, if you say it's in your wheelhouse, you better hit it. (laughs) You better, you better try and find a way to get that done because otherwise you're not really living up to the promise that you made to them. Um, But another thing that Chris touched on that I think is really key is that brokers, don't mind early declines. What they hate is slow nose. So as long as you tell a broker early on, I mean, like I tell brokers after reading the summary within hours, sometimes like, Hey, not going to be a good fit here. And um, they almost always appreciate that. Right. Because they, if anyone who's been a broker long enough has had to deal with a scenario where they went two or three months down the line with the bank and then they got left at the altar because all of a sudden a credit committee decided that they didn't like a deal. Um, and, you know, even if that does happen again in that situation, the main thing is just being honest with your with your broker and just explain the situation, why you were taken off garden in that situation and, you know, what you're going to do in the future to make sure it doesn't happen again. So my biggest takeaway from all of this almost sounds like my my word I would choose to be education. The BDO has been educated. Your um, your credit teams under are educating your BDO. Uh, you're educating your referral partner. You're being you're able to educate your borrower. Globally, everybody is learning from these experiences. Um, another question I had for you, Sterling, specifically was, I want to talk about your success with sending these deals directly to bank, like bank referrals. Can you touch on that a little bit? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, as Chris knows well, I mean, a lot of the production that I do are really, they're declines from other banks. So it's bankers that I've had a relationship with over the years. You know, um, on episode one, I kind of talked about, you know, at my last shop, um, we didn't incentivize brokers at all. So it kind of forced me to go out and build relationships in different ways. And one of the ways that I decided I would build my relationships is with other local lenders. So I would go out, I would, you know, uh, take them out for drinks or, or lunch or dinner or whatever it may be, kind of meet them on their terms, whatever uh, they were comfortable with. And, you know, over time, I just, I just kind of became friends with these guys. And so what, they, what happened is as soon as I switched shops and I came to a place that had a little bit more of a flexible credit box and um, geographically would allow me to lend in all 50 states, you know, all these guys that were in my circle from before we're like, Hey, I have this deal. We're not doing it because of this, or we're not doing it because of that. And all of a sudden, you know, I started getting an influx of deals from other banks that just maybe had a, a, a tighter credit box than my bank had, or just had a different credit box than my bank had not. And that's still something I do till this day. Um, you know, yesterday I reached out to a bank of America guy, um, asking him about what type of deals that they do, because I know Bank of America is going to have a tight credit box. I reached out to a girl from Citibank today. I reached out to another guy from Cruise Bank today. I'm going to try and grab lunch with um, the girl next week and, and the guy from Cruise Bank next week. So, um, you know, that's still a way that I continue to to build my referral pipeline, because, you know, I personally think that lenders can be better than brokers. Um, you know, they, they see deals just as much as brokers. Um, and a lot of times they know the deal better than a broker might know the deal. Um, and what they, what they definitely know better than a broker in most instances is going to be credit. Um, they're going to know what a deal is that can get done at a shop and what deal cannot get done at a shop. You know, we all know if I turn a deal down, I know for sure if it can get done somewhere else, like that deal that Chris was talking about today that we ended up passing on that deal will 100% get done somewhere else. Okay. And so, you know, maybe I'll send it to somebody or uh, maybe I'll tell the broker where he can go. Um, but I always try and leave it with helping somebody on my way out. That's, that's always the note I want to leave it on. 100%. Yeah. And, and Sterling is, he's always out with some banker uh, for lunch uh, or some meeting with a banker. And it's Ocean Prime. I miss point. you. Yeah, Ocean Prime. I'm on, I'm on a strict diet. I haven't there. been in there in a win. I, I miss you though, baby. I'll be back. <laughs> that's that's okay. That's the challenge for this episode. If you're a you're a BDO listening to this, take a banker out to your local Ocean Prime for lunch <laughs> and build some rapport. If Ocean Prime's outside of your budget, find a nice sandwich cafe and uh, treat them to a you know maybe a tuna sandwich or something. But seriously, build some rapport with your banker network because. They know what deals work uh, and they can tell you quickly why it didn't fit their their shop. And it just it does a lot of the legwork for you. Here's the strengths. Here are the weaknesses. Here's why we couldn't get it done. You know, brokers are great referral partners as well. But sometimes it's hard to cut through a lot of the noise on a deal when you're getting it from a, a broker referral source. Whereas from a banker, they're just going to cut it to you straight. So you know, be successful in that challenge. Take somebody out to lunch that's in the banking industry. Yeah, and if you go to Ocean Prime, you know, get a Prime Night roll, okay? That's on the secret menu. So Sterling just puts you on something new there, okay? And get butter a cake? cucumber no, gimlet. You're not going to drop butter cake? Oh, hold on now. Hold on. We're going to get the dessert yet. <laughs> I okay, we were cake talking this about week. drinks. How random is that? <laughs> <laughs> no, then you get a cucumber gimlet, oh, okay? Man. But you swap out the gin for pineapple infused tequila. All oh, right. Oof. Oof. So I'm just putting you on something. And then you get the carrot cake, not the butter cake, but you tell them to heat it up. That's how you do Ocean Prime. Ooh. Your drama. Ooh. Are, you, are you off butter cake? <laughs> You're off butter cake? Uh, look, butter cake's always my first love. You know, I have no beef with butter cake at all, but I'm on the carrot cake kick these days and you got to have it heated up. That's the only way. Sterling was actually out with some bankers one day at Ocean Prime and I didn't know he'd be there. And I was there with the referral uh, source and uh, uh, my associate lender. It must not have been and, a decline. Uh, of bringing, <laughs> no, <laughs> and instead of sending a bottle of champagne, like, uh, you know, I sent him uh, t- the table of butter cake. Oh. That's good. He did a lunchtime yeah. butter cake. I'll never yeah. complain. Yeah. Sign of appreciation there. So Respect. we've got our food, our food um, advice for our new BDOs. So if you guys could both wrap this up with two quick sentences on just how to handle declines as a new BDO, what would you say to them quick? Like the, what's the most, like the most important thing that comes to your brain? Chris, you go first and then Sterling. 
two sentences. Yeah, two quick, two quick fat. sentences, dirty. Like this is this is just how you have to handle it. Don't cry. <laughs> yeah, with with declines, act fast in delivering the news to yeah. all parties, referral sources, uh, borrowers. So act fast, and and two learn. Learn why your deals are getting declined. Learn your credit box and, and push to have you know zero declines. You need to be honest and you need to be quick. That's it. I love those answers, you guys. Thank you. Well, um, that was a very interesting topic. I'm really happy we went over that. You know, we talked. Are we more on topic without yeah. Alan? Is that is there a theme here? Mm-hmm. I feel like we were actually making good content and points today. <laughs> well. Well, I did want to thank everybody for joining us today. Again, I will always remind you, hit the subscribe button, share with your friends, share on LinkedIn. Um, We're going to be everywhere. Uh, Go ahead and invite whoever you want to listen to these. They're all going to be educational. They're going to be exciting. They're going to be funny. Um, Hit the subscribe button, the like button, and then send any of your topics or any ideas or anything you want to chat about over to the BDO show at gmail.com and we'll get them in the queue uh, to talk about. So again, thank you for joining us until next time.